my name is Dave Rambo. I'm all the way from the Wisconsin Dells in Wisconsin. And uh, I'm here today to talk a little bit about the way photography was done when Sturgis was just beginning in the 1870s. What I have with me are the camera type that would have been used. This is the most portable camera in the 1870s. As well as photo lab that traveled with the photographer and the technician with them in the field. And the type of photography I'll be doing today and demonstrating for everybody is pretty much the standard practice all over the United States until the late 1880s when a fellow named George Eastman in New York State developed something called the dry plane process, which means you didn't have to bring your lab with you or that changed now today's photography, we don't even recognize film anymore. It's all done digitally with pixels and a computer. But um, last month I had a reporter from a local newspaper interview me. She didn't even know what a piece of film was. So we've gotten to that, that time where there's this great gap in the knowledge of what was and what is. So what I'm trying to do is kind of show what was, how photography has changed, in some ways how it's the same. At the time of this camera, photography was still in its infancy. And um, before this type of process, the wet plate process, there was something called the daguerreotype process, which was invented in France by a man named Louis Daguerre. And the daguerreotype was fairly expensive to produce. There was some of that done in our country, but a lot of it was done in Europe. And what you would do is you take a piece of copper that had been buffed and polished until it was like a mirror. Then you would dip it in a vat of silver nitrate and other chemicals, and that would form a film on it. You'd expose it in a camera. The exposures of, say, a person's portrait might be as long as 20, 30, 40, 50 seconds. And if it was indoors, it might be minutes. So it was very painful. Not many people could sit still long enough to get a nice crisp photo out in the After that was done, you take the plate that you couldn't see the picture on yet, you put it in something called a fuming box, which had boiling mercury in it. And the mercury fumes would connect to that silver nitrate and that would make the image viable where you could actually see it. And if, if you own a daguerreotype, you can always tell because when you turn it a little bit, it looks like a mirror. And that's because of the mercury. It makes it look like a mirror. And they're very beautiful. They're exquisitely beautiful. Fairly expensive then and now. But if you own one, it's a treasure. Um, unfortunately, if they get exposed to air, they oxidize. So they're not very archivally um, sound. And despite that, they were expensive to make. Because you're using mercury, and it's a very expensive material, and the copper and the other chemicals. So photographers were looking for a cheaper, quicker way to do things. This was it. The wet plate process. You could take simple glass or metal or even asphalt sheets and dip them in certain chemicals, make them photosensitive, make images from them. Uh, the materials I use today, I go to a hardware store and get single pane window glass and cut a glass cover. So it's so available. I don't have to go find mercury, special copper plates and that sort of thing. So it made life easier. Like with the daguerreotype, the wet plate process did have drawbacks still. I guess it's a little problem where we still were working with chemicals. Those chemicals are poisonous, they're explosive, and if you mix the wrong two together accidentally, they can make gas, which was similar to years ago they used to use in the gas chamber. So it's not, a, not good if you don't know what you're doing. Another drawback image, the negative or the plate you're making is only light sensitive if it's wet. Dry now. So good so there's, once you take it out of that chemical, put it in the back of your camera, it's like
like a little clock is ticking in your head. You might have two or three or four minutes. You have to take it back and develop it. <coughs> if you don't, it's right. Yes. So take it from there, it's wet, you put it in there, take the image, and make sure it's still wet, and put it back. Correct. Yeah, then you only open it up inside this box so you don't you know, expose it to the light. Like film. So after much trial and error, photographers learned the limits of what they were doing. This type of photography, there's no such thing as a candid photo. There's no such thing as an unposed photo. So anytime you see a glass plate photo of the American Civil War or a kid type from the West, they're very carefully posed. Even if it's of two boxers, or two guys dueling with swords, they're not really dueling with swords, they're posing with swords. So, um, hard, hard to take things. The images that were hard to take. Um, people and animals, we couldn't understand the same stuff. So, baby, doctors hate taking baby portraits. Usually you'd have to take several, tell the baby stop crying or whatever is going on. And dogs, horses, we get it. If a horse, if you're holding your horse, standing beside it, if you're standing very still, the horse boxes that just a little bit, you end up with an image of a guy holding a headless horse. So just that little bit of a movement will blur to the point where you can't see what that is. Um, it's kind of fun when recreating these. There, in the old days in the American Civil War, usually there was one guy in every group that didn't get the memo to stand still. <laughs> so usually when I'm taking these images at events, historical reenactments, I always have one person kind of sacrifice themselves, walk away, maybe going this fast, and it looks just like a ghostly trail walking away. So it's kind of fun to play with that. For Halloween, we can do like fun special effects too, where we can do double exposures, where one person's a see through spirit or something where they just walk out of the frame and you can see their image well, you, you can see through them you can see the chair behind them so you can make that work for you but most of the time you don't want anybody the camera itself is really simple like I maybe said earlier this is a reproduction this was made for me in 2007 but it's based on the exact camera that we're using here in the field Portable camera at that time. It's on a tripod. You can't use it just holding it in your hands. You had to have it set on something. Usually you'd have to pose this, and focus this, and have your whatever you're taking a photo of positioned before you get the film and put it in the back. So this part is kind of important. The lenses I have with this are all uh, original lenses. They're kind of hard to find these days, the brass ones. So these are mostly um, German um, 1850s, 60s, and 70s hand ground glass lenses. Today for our demonstration I'll be using this littler lens which can take you know a wider angle and uh, with your permission I'd like to take an image of maybe this group if we could all get together a little closer in a few minutes. But we'll be showing if you don't just step around behind it no one will know any difference. But the camera works much, much the same as maybe your digital camera today. It's a view camera, so you'll see the image in the glass on the back when you take the lens cap off. Can anybody see anything there? It's probably too bright. Yeah, you can see the lines. That's my grid. That's my cheater's grid to know what I'm doing. But you'll uh, you focus through looking at this screen. The first thing you'll notice is the image is upside down. So the top of your plate is at the bottom, and the bottom is at the top when you put it in. Um, on a bright day like today, it's a little hard to see because there's too much light. So that's where this shroud comes in handy. And I just have an old raincoat, which is maybe appropriate for today. <laughs> and I'll just put it over my head to focus the camera while you're looking through the back. Just have this little knock. Show 
this in classes, kids are a little bit disappointed when they open the camera itself. There ain't nothing in there. So it's, it's just a, it's a camera obscura, it's a dark box. So there's really nothing in the camera except the distance to focus. That's really all it has going for it. The magic all happens in there. Make this image work. Put the wet film in the back. We focus already. We know it's in focus. So you swing this out of the way. Put the film in a special little holder in the back. Slide the special baffle out, which is supposed to be in front. Take the image. Tell the people to hold still. Let's cap off and count backwards. Five. Today's is sheet aluminum. Um, get, I get this from a uh, company in Chicago that does trophy metal. Instead of engraving it, I just have them cut it into the sheet sizes that I want. Originally, tin types were done on sheet steel. And a photographer would have to take that sheet steel and Japan varnish it. So you paint what looks like dap on it. You put it in a little wood oven and it bakes varnish on it and it turns it black but that's that's how it works this is on a piece of glass you can kind of see the emulsion on the piece of glass it looks like a negative but with the black contrast behind it it's a positive so what I'm adding here with this black is I'm adding the contrast so it actually looks like positive Pass a few of these around. Some of these are movie shots from movies I've worked on. Others are from events like in Wisconsin at the White House. This is from Vicksburg, Mississippi. That's our president, Abraham Lincoln, and our general, Ulysses S. Grant. So we'll pass those around, as well as this, uh, what we call an ambrotype, so you can kind of see how the process looks without the black one. While you're doing that, I'm going to duck into the dark room. Pay no attention to the man. Now I'll get this started and I'll be right back out. Then we'll get you all, whoever wants to be in the photo, assembled. Yeah. <laughs> 
Doing this, I've learned the utmost respect for those pioneers that have done this because they were dealing with elements I can't imagine. There's danger, the explosive things, finding water, and all of the things you need to worry about. Lugging this up. Yeah, lugging that up the top of Castle Creek to get the picture of the little 110 wagon train down below. But in his defense, I'm sure he had technicians. As far as we know, he did. All right. So that's resting in the in the uh, silver. It has to stay in there for three minutes. This is about as high tech as I get. That's my timer. So somebody tell me when that's done. Um, I have some propaganda here about where I work now. I've taken this hobby, and now it's. My occupation, I'm uh, the manager of the oldest continuously operating photo studio in the United States. And we're located downtown in the Wisconsin Dells, which is much like Sturgis during Harley Week all the time. It's very busy. So, I'd love to see some friendly faces in the summer, so come on down here. All right. Let's see if I can back off enough to get a picture of as many of you who want to be in this room. Yes. 
lens has a very thin depth of field. So you will be in focus. Everything behind and in front will be very blurry. So that's really kind of easy. This lens is called a pet ball. I do use this mostly for portrait work. as a blur. So don't scratch your nose or if your friend yells, don't turn your head. Hold still. We'll open this. And I'm going to run this for about five seconds. I'll count slow. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Clear. That's it. You've done good. I'm going to pour some vinegar on this, and I'll come out with the pan out here, and we can get a closer look, and I'll, you'll be able to see the magic happen. Hopefully it'll work.
I don't know who it is. We'll see in a sec. This says it's Hostetter's stomach bitters, but it's not. <laughs> this is a, a fixer made out of potassium cyanide and water. So there's your image. You all look like negative people. We'll make you positive. <laughs> Hang on, here we go. That's the magic. Right. I'll have this here. I'm going to change it out of this fixer, put it in a pan of water. It'll be right there on the dark box if anyone would like to come get a closer look. Um, if anyone has any questions other than just looking at this, hang around. We have examples. You can poke your head in the dark room if you dare. <laughs> Take a look and smell the smells. And um, this afternoon I'll be out at Barry Stadium at Fort Meade if you'd like to watch this a little more detailed or maybe you can get your image struck. All right. Well, enjoy your day. I'm glad. Thanks for coming by and um, enjoy the parade. I think we got a perfect day for it. Thanks. Would you ever that? This is such the emotions on the front. This was on glass. We turn it over. This is the glass. No, it's always backwards. So that picture of Billy the Kid, where he's left handed. That's why they thought he was left handed. The first movie they did, they had him left handed. Yeah, for a couple of women had him. Do you ever do like uh, yeah, they grow. You're gonna be out at this day. Yeah, I'll be there today. Oh, thank you. In my lab, I do portraits. Yeah. How much does that cost? Uh, for a four by six, which is this size, it's like fifty bucks. This just from use, it drains down. You know, I just pour it back. I filter out the gel that you After a while, it's just a punch. It gets kind of like wine. It's better. How big is the other one? It's a little Oh, yeah, it's all in the Yeah, the thing you use the most of is water. And you notice when this guy was bringing Custer's people over, you could tell when he didn't have water. Lavender and gum sandrac varnish. I poured the varnish over it and you put it over a kerosene lamp and it bakes the la lavender varnish on it. That'll seal that in. If I right now took my finger and that across the face of it, you can rub it right off. So this is not burned or engraved or into the metal. It's like just that thin emulsion running 